Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. being the Passover. It so happens that astronomically, both the sun and the moon and the earth are all in exactly the wrong place. They're all in the wrong place for a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse or any other natural reason why the light will fail. There's no other natural reason why there will be darkness over all the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And so the second most startling thing is in the text is that the bystanders have nothing to say about it. As Jesus, whose preaching and miracles they knew, is crucified there in front of them, and darkness covers the land, All they can do is laugh and jeer as they mishear him. For when he says, Eli, Eli, they think he's calling Elijah and not God. The miracles themselves are not proof to anybody. The miracles will not miracle anybody else into the kingdom of God. It has come, does come, and always will come by faith. They cannot hear what is behind the crying question of Jesus. When he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They would do well to recognize that the darkness is part of that. The darkness, again, is not an astronomical phenomenon. It is the divine demonstration that what Jesus sees is exactly what is. That he is, in fact, forsaken. There is no other help. There is no other rescue. There is no consoling, psychologizing. There, there, Jesus, the Father has not really forsaken you. He's around us all the time, don't you know? And other hallmark nonsense. Jesus asks why he is forsaken. Because he is, in fact, forsaken. The father cannot bear to look at his son. 
He cannot bear to look at his son because he is covered in your sin. All of these things which mar his image, all of these things make Jesus detestable. A gory holocaust from which the Father turns away his face, and so darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. The cry is recognition of Jesus' agony. This indeed, like his love, hurts him. This is the true torment of the cross. Yes, we know that scourge and rod and nails and gasping breath, exasperation, yes, these things hurt. And yes, these things have been suffered by men. But this is not the pain of the cross. This is what we mean when we say that Jesus suffers death and hell. Because he suffers the Father turning his face away. He, fought, he suffers the Father's forsaking of him. And he does it for you. No, Elijah will not come to help. No, some innocent bystander will not come to help. No, Jesus would not have it anyway. This is the purpose for which Jesus came. That you would not be forsaken. You could ask why. There were other uh, ideas that had some traction in the late 90s, early 2000s. That God was as some divine child abuser. And yet, this is the Son's will also. That he be forsaken, so that you would not be forsaken. This is also the message of the darkness. That while the Father's face is turned away from his Son, because of all the sin that stains him, the Father's face is turned kindly toward you. Because as Jesus has taken on your sin, he has likewise given to you, imputed to you, his own righteousness, his own blessedness, his perfect keeping of the law. All of this is now given to you. And so because Jesus is forsaken, because he who knew no sin was made sin for you, because of this, you will never be forsaken. You made righteous by Christ. You who have received the spirit that he has yielded up, and so cling to him in faith. You will never be forsaken.